thank you for joining us. This is Dimensions of Prophecy with Kenneth Cox. I'm Brenda Wood. Our subject this evening is taken directly from the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter. Pastor Cox has entitled it, The Beauty and the Beast. There are three principal characters in this chapter. First, there is the dragon, which is the beast. Then there's a beautiful woman and a child. We want to find out who this beautiful woman represents in Bible prophecy, who the child is, and the symbolism for the dragon. This is an extremely important prophecy found in the book of Revelation. Tonight, we'll put many things in perspective as we study together. Let's open our hearts and minds and ask the Holy Spirit to fill our lives with the blessings from Scripture as we study together the beauty and the beast. I'm sure that it wouldn't come as any surprise this evening if I was to tell you that the religious world is full of confusion tonight. There seems to be so many voices that are beckoning for the floor, so many causes that are seeking our allegiance. One church says we have the truth, another church says we have the truth. Kind of reminds me of a little girl that was invited by our neighbor to go to church with her. The little girl responded by saying, I'm sorry, can't go to church with you because we belong to a different abomination. <laughs> you know, and while we can smile and about it, yet tonight there are over 300 different major denominations, and yet we read the same Bible, the same God, but it was never, never was God's desire that the religious world would be as fragmented as it is tonight. Never was God's desire. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, it says this, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now listen very carefully. Till we all come to the what? Unity of faith. It says that God desires, God wants us to come to the unity of faith. He doesn't want the religious world to be fragmented, to be mixed up as it is tonight. He wants us to come to a unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftness by which they lie and wait to deceive. God said, listen, I don't want you tossed to and fro. I don't want you carried about by every wind of doctrine, but I do want you to come to the unity of faith. How do you do that? How is that possible? The only way that can be done, friends, is you're going to have to get in the book. There's no other way. You've got to get in the Scripture. You've got to find out what the Scripture says. Listen to me. You don't find truth by a church. I don't care what church it is. You don't find truth by a church. You find truth by the Word of God. That's how you find truth. You get into the Scripture. You find out what God's Word says. And if you can find out what the Scripture says, then you can know truth. That's how we arrive at the unity of faith is by what God's Word says. Now, I'm going to share with you a little poem. I'll use it a number of times as we study together. I hope as we do, you'll learn it. It goes something like this. What says the Bible, the blessed Bible? This my only question be. The teachings of men so often mislead us. What says the Bible to me? That's what we want to find out. We want to find out just exactly what does God's Word say to you and say to me. We need to know that. All right, tonight, I want us to drop back in time and take a look at what the Scripture says developed in heaven. Now, you know, you and I, uh, we're accustomed to there being war. We hear about it on the television. We, uh, we hear, read about it in the newspaper. 
we've come to the place where we pretty much accept war, but the Scripture has a very interesting thing to say about war. In fact, it says this in Revelation 12, verse 7, and there was war in where? Heaven. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. It says that war broke out in heaven. And as you go back and you read God's word, you'll find that God created an angel. This angel was the highest angel in all of heaven stood next to the throne of God. Referred to in the scripture as the covering cherub. Now I'm going to read you some scripture about him. He was known as Lucifer. That was what he was called. Stood next to God's throne. Now God makes a comparison between Lucifer and the prince of Tyre. And I want you to listen to what it says about it here in the book of Ezekiel. Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus saith the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a, what? A God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart is the heart of God. It says that this angel that God had created and made with his own hands that was the highest angel in all of heaven, says he wanted to be God, desired to be God. Listen as it describes him. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, and it names all the stones, and I'm not going to take time to read them all. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. It says that he was right there in the presence of God, walked back and forth across the sea of glass. You were what? Perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now, please get something real clear. God created an angel by the name of Lucifer. That angel, when God created him, was perfect. God did not create a devil. God created an angel that was perfect, but he gave to that angel just the same as he has given to you and he's given to me, he's given to each one of us the ability to make a decision. Power of choice. He gave that to Lucifer, and Lucifer rebelled against God, and it says iniquity was found in him. What is that iniquity? Listen, Isaiah. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you, how you are cut down to the ground who did weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of... God, I will also sit in the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. This angel that God had created and made with his own hands, that was the highest angel in all of heaven, wanted to be God. And war broke out in heaven. With that war, it says this is what happened. And the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So it says they were cast out of heaven. The devil and one-third, the scripture says, of all the angelic hosts came to this earth. Now I want to ask you something. Do you think that when Lucifer came here that he no longer wanted to be God? No, he still wanted to be God as much as ever. And you remember the Lord Jesus Christ came. And it says that he was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness where he fasted for 40 days. Lucifer, the devil, came to him after he had been fasting for 40 days and said, 
if you be the Son of God. Turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then it says that the devil took him to the pinnacle of the temple. And he said it says there in Psalms that the Lord has given his angels charge over thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jump off and see if they'll take care of you. Would that tempt you? Huh? Would that tempt you? Wouldn't tempt me. Then why was it a temptation to Christ? You know what the pinnacle of the temple is? Do you know what the pinnacle of the temple is? You know, you think it's up on top of the building. It's not. The pinnacle of the temple was the edge of the temple wall. They're still there today. You can see where it was. And it's 500 foot from the top to the ground. You see, they had a tradition about that. The Jewish people had talked about it as a tradition down through the years, and they said when the Messiah came, he would jump off there and it wouldn't hurt him. So the devil was using that very tradition, saying, if you are the Son of God, if you the Messiah, show the people that you are and jump off. And Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then it says that he took him to an exceeding high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of this world. Now let me tell you something. Every last one of you, you possess something that's worth more than your money. It's worth more than your home. It's worth more than your car. It's worth more than anything you have. It's actually worth more than your life. You possess something, and that is the ability to worship is the greatest possession that you have. It's worth more than anything else that you have is your ability to worship. And the devil took him up on this top of this mountain, and he said, listen, I'll give you all this and said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and what? Worship me. The devil said, I'll give it all to you if you'll just worship me. You see, it lies within your hands to decide what's God. That's within your hands. You can make a God out of that if you want to. You can say, this will be my God. Now, he won't be able to do anything, but nevertheless, you can say that. It's worth more than anything else you have. And he said, listen, I'll give you the whole world if you'll just fall down and worship me. And Christ said, depart from me. Get thee behind me, Satan. You need very, very carefully to protect your right, your privilege to worship. Now, the devil wants that. He desires that more than anything else. You remember when Eve, God placed them here in the garden, told them they could eat anything they wanted. And the devil asked Eve that. He said, has the Lord said that you can't eat of anything here in the garden? Listen to what she said. She said to him, we can eat anything in the garden here except this tree. This one tree, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God has said we're not to eat of it. Listen to the devil's reply. He said, for God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like what? God, knowing good and evil. He said, sure, the Lord doesn't want you to eat of it. Why, if you eat of it, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And you remember, she ate of it. And she gave it to Adam and he ate. I marvel. Can you just imagine? Here God has created two beings. He's placed them on the earth. He's given them everything they want. Everything that they could desire is there. I mean in an absolute perfect setting. And they've already rebelled against him. And he turns right around 
and promises them a way out. That's grace, folks. That's what he says. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. Between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He promised right there, he said, listen, I'm going to put enmity, that means discord, dislike, between you, the woman, and the serpent. Between you and the woman, between the serpent and the woman, he said, I'm going to put discord, dislike, and he said, the seed of the woman will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. And dear friend, the seed of the woman there is Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ died on Calvary, it bruised his heel. But I can tell you when the Lord Jesus Christ died on Calvary, he defeated the devil. And dear friend, I always want to ask you, the devil's a defeated foe. Why are you struggling so much? Accept it. I mean, he doesn't need to win over you. He's defeated. Christ defeated him. He bruised his head at Calvary. I don't have to take that. He is defeated foe. Jesus has already done it for you. That's what he's done. Gave him a promise, promise of redemption. Now, follow carefully. You see, God simply takes and divides things into twos. You find as you read through Scripture, he divides things into twos. He talks about the righteous and the what? The unrighteous. Say twos. He talks about the saved and the lost. Say twos, not threes, twos. He talks about the sheep and the goats. He divides it up. Now, we just read a text in Genesis 3 and verse 15, and it said, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He divided things into two. Did you catch that? He talks about the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Two different groups of people. The seed of the woman are the righteous. That's talking about people like Adam and Eve, Noah, the David, the prophets, all the people that Paul, John, people that walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, you, individuals that have turned their lives over to Christ, they are known in the Scripture as the seed of the woman. Now, there's also two cities in the Bible. One belongs to the Lord, one belongs to the devil. Do you know what God's city is called? Well, it's called Zion or Jerusalem. That's what it's called. Jerusalem. All the way through the Bible, as you read through your Bible here, it'll talk about Jerusalem, it'll talk about Zion. But when you get to the New Testament, and Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you, the hen gather her chicks, and you were not willing and you find they rejected him, now the New Testament talks about the new Jerusalem. Okay, that's his city, the new Jerusalem. The people worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You see, they have made a commitment of their life to Jesus Christ. Now, the seed of the serpent is simply that of the wicked. That's what it's talking about. That's the seed of the serpent, the wicked. Those are people like during the time of the flood when they refused. They would not follow the Lord. Noah preached to them for 120 years, and they said no. It's like the people in the Tower of Babel. It's the people that followed pagan gods. It's those people that do not accept Jesus Christ, do not follow the Lord. They are referred to in the Scripture as the seed of the serpent. They have a city. You know what that city is? Yeah, the Bible talks about Babylon. Babylon is referred to as the devil's city. 
Now, there was a city of Babylon, but it lies in ruins today, and so when you get in the New Testament, it talks about mystical Babylon. And many of these people, even though they don't know it, they follow the devil. For it simply says in Romans 6, 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves servants to obey, you are that one servant whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness? You see, if you, if you follow somebody, then you're that person's servant. And many of them do, some of them ignorantly. Now, we're kind of laying a basis. We're fixing to begin to pull some principles home that I hope will help you greatly. All right, let's listen to what it says here in Jeremiah 6, 2. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate what? Woman. Now, if you pick up the Bible and you begin to study Bible prophecy, you'll find that all the way through Bible prophecy, God refers to his church as a woman, says that he's coming back after his bride. So you'll find that all the way through Scripture, it refers to his church or a church as a woman. For instance, when I was a boy, there's a text over in Isaiah, the fourth chapter, verse 1. And it says, in the last days, seven women will take hold of one man, and they will say, let us eat our own bread, let us wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. When I was a boy, they told me that meant there'd be seven women for every man. That isn't what that's talking about. You know, when it says, in the last days there, There'd be seven women take hold of one man. That number seven in Scripture represents completeness. And when it talks about women there, it's talking about churches. And it says they'll take hold of one man, that one man being Jesus Christ. And they will say, let us eat our own bread. That means let us believe like we want to. Let us wear our own apparel. Let us act like we want to. Only let us be called Christian to take away our reproach. That's what it's saying. So God uses that comparison, and when we get into Bible prophecy and we get into Revelation, the 12th chapter tonight, you're going to find a good woman. We're going to talk about her. That represents a good church. But boy, when you get over into Revelation, the 17th chapter, you find a woman on a scarlet-colored beast full of abominations, the Scripture says, and blasphemy. That represents a bad church. Okay? So I hope we're beginning to put down some principles to understanding Bible prophecy. Now that we have that, let's go to Revelation, the 12th chapter, and begin to put together what we've learned. And I saw, and a great sign, excuse me, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. So it talks about this woman, and it says that she is clothed with the sun. On, the he on her head is a crown of 12 stars, and under her feet is the moon. That woman represents God's church. It represents a good woman. It represents his church. When it says that she's clothed with the sun, it means the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, that is the light, dear friends. There is no other light. Yet that sun represents the gospel of Jesus Christ, the crown of 12 stars on her head represented the 12 apostles, and the moon under her feet represented the Old Testament period that it was just coming out of. Because Israel had been that woman, and then when they rejected him, it just moves right in and becomes the church. That's what it's talking about. Now listen as it continues. And being with child, she cried out in labor, and in pain to give birth. So it says that she's pregnant. She's about to give birth. Okay. She brought forth a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. 
Now, dear friends, I want to tell you tonight, you can look at that text all you want to, but there's only one individual, only one, that fulfills that prophecy, not another one. The only child that's ever been born that was to rule the world with a rod of iron and was caught up unto God and to his throne was Jesus Christ. He's the only one. So this is talking about the birth of Jesus Christ, and it says that he would rule the nations with a rod of iron. Okay, so that woman represents the early church. The child represents Jesus Christ. Now let's watch because there becomes another figure here, another character. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. So it says that all of a sudden here appears a great red dragon. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So it says that this dragon is standing before that woman ready to devour that child just as soon as it was born. Now, we shouldn't have too much difficulty putting this together, finding out what it's talking about, because I think all of you remember the Christmas story. You remember that Caesar Augustus has sent out a decree that all the world should be taxed. Joseph and Mary has made their way down to Bethlehem, pay their taxes. While they're there, Jesus is born. Okay? You remember that. All right, you also remember that there were some wise men over in the east who had been following this star. The scripture says that they followed that star to Jerusalem. And when they got to Jerusalem, they began to inquire about the child. It upset the whole city. So much so that Herod called them in, asked them who they were looking for, and they said, oh, we're looking for this child that's to be born king. He called in the scribes and he said, where's this child to be born? They said he's to be born down in Bethlehem. He told the wise men to go on down to Bethlehem. It would be shown them, or they would find the child there. And when they had found the child, to come and tell him that he might go and worship him also. Those wise men made their way on to Bethlehem, and there they found the child, and they offered their gold and myrrh and frankincense. And then an angel told those wise men to go back another way because Herod sought the life of that child. That same angel chose Joseph and Mary to take the child and to flee to Egypt. This is what happened. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all the regions from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Sent out his soldier and had every male child in Bethlehem slain. It says that that dragon would stand before the woman ready to devour the child as soon as it was born. Now listen carefully to me, because in Bible prophecy, this red dragon... In the first sense, first sense will always represent the devil. The Bible refers to him as the dragon, the old serpent. Always represents the devil in the first sense. But in the second sense, the red dragon in Bible prophecy will refer to pagan Rome. You see, the devil never does anything out in the open. He always uses a power or a system to accomplish his end. And that great red dragon represented the power of pagan Rome because that is the power that Herod used to try to take the life of the child. Okay, so we have identified those characters. The woman represents the church. The child was Jesus Christ. The red dragon, that of pagan Rome. Now listen carefully as it begins to develop it farther. And when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted who? The woman who gave birth to the male child. It says that the old devil, or pagan Rome, 
turned its persecution upon the church. And dear friends, I wish I had time tonight to talk to you a little bit about the catacombs over in Italy and some of those places and all that the church went through as it was persecuted by the power of pagan Rome. Did everything he could to do away with the church. Christ had given that commission to the disciples. You see, he had told them they were to preach in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and where? To all the world. Okay. Those people took that commission seriously and they went out and they began to preach and people began to accept it. And as people accepted it, Rome, pagan Rome, turned all its fury against that of the church. You call yourselves Christians, right? Huh? Isn't that what you call yourself? Do you understand that word? Do you understand the heritage of that word? Let me tell you what it meant to be a Christian back then. You see, Rome had lots of gods. I mean, hundreds of gods. They didn't care very much who you worship. They didn't care about that. They wanted your allegiance. But their patent, patron god was Dia Roma. And so they just passed a very simple law. Once each year, you had to go down, walk into the court there, take a little bit of incense, drop it in the fire before this goddess, Dia Roma, and say, Dia Roma. That, not, that really was like saying, I am allegiance or I am patriotic to Rome. But it's really worshiping that pagan god. When you did that, they would give you a certificate and you could go out and worship any god you wanted to. They didn't care. But the Christians, when they were brought in and they handed them that little bit of incense, they refused to drop it in the fire. They refused to say, Dia Roma. They said, we will worship only God. We will worship only the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, they were taken to arenas. Put out in the arenas, there were men, women, children out in those arenas, and lions that hadn't eaten for days were turned loose into those arenas and they became food for lions. That's what it meant to be a Christian. I mean, when you said, I'm a Christian, you were putting your life on the line. That's where the word came from. That meant people that were followers of Jesus Christ. That's what it was talking about. But it seemed for everyone that died, two more sprang up. They had to worship in caves. In those catacombs over in Rome, there were people that were born there, lived and died and never saw the light of day. They were hunted like animals. Rome did everything she could to get rid of them. But it continues on and says, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now it says that this woman fled into the wilderness where God had a special place prepared for her for how long? 1,260 days. Now that is said again here in Revelation the 12th chapter. It's repeated only it's said in a little different way, and I want you to listen to how it's said. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time from the face of the serpent. So here it says, the woman is taken out in the wilderness and she's nourished there for a time, times, and a half a time. Now, a time 
In Bible prophecy represents one year. Okay? There happens to be 360 days in a biblical year. Did you hear what I said? There happens to be 360 days in a biblical year, and if you don't believe me, then you take your Bible and you turn over to Genesis, the seventh chapter, where it talks about the flood, and you read when Noah went into the ark on the 600th day and so forth, and you'll find that there's exactly 360 days in a biblical year. So time represents one year. Times represents two years. A half a time would represent a half a year. Now let's see what happens because I gave you some text the other night that said over in Ezekiel, the fourth chapter in verse 6, said, I have appointed thee a day for a year. Numbers 14, 34 says, I have given you a day for a year. So if I have time, that's one year, 360 days. Times is two years, 720 days. A dividing of time or a half of time is 180 days. And if I add them, they come to what? 1,260, just the same as the other verse. Saying the same thing, that he was going to go, the church was going to go into the wilderness for 1,260 days, and each day represents one year, or she would be there for 1,260 years. The church, listen to me, the church went into the wilderness in 538 A.D. If you add... 1,260 years to that, it'll take you to 1798. Now, when I study with you the Antichrist as prophesied in the Bible, I'll tell you what happened in 538 A.D. I'll tell you what happened in 1798. I'll tell you why the church went into the wilderness that time. We don't have enough time to do all that tonight. But I can tell you, we'll go into that, and you'll see exactly. 1,260 years that she was there. Okay, it continues on in Revelation 12, and it says this, And the earth helped the woman. The earth helped the church, the woman. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon spewed out of its mouth. The old dragon spewed out such a flood of persecution that it looked like it was going to wipe the church off the earth. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood. Two things happened. One was the discovery of this part of the world. Our forefathers came over here fleeing what? Persecution. They said, we want to come to a place where we can worship like we want to worship according to the dictates of our own conscience. And those pilgrims came over here Fleeing persecution. That's one thing that happened. The other thing that happened is along came some men like Erasmus and the Renaissance began to open up and out of that came what was known as the Reformation and men like Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg and told the people that everybody ought to have the right to read the Scripture. Great preacher of righteousness. And then along came other men like John Calvin who wrote books called The Institute, a great pre institute, a great preacher of righteousness. And then along came other men like Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, and these men preached and said that everybody had the right to worship as the Holy Spirit led them in Scripture. And then some of the kings and some of the princes of Europe began to stand up and they said, listen, we're not going to be dictated to any longer. We're going to worship as the Holy Spirit leads us. According to the dictates of our conscience, we will follow the Lord. And people begin to pick up the Scripture. They begin to read it. They begin to study it for themselves. And they said to themselves, what says the Bible? 
the blessed Bible, this my only question be, the teachings of men so often mislead us. What says the Bible to me? Now, we've looked at that 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, but I want you to look at the very last verse with me, verse 17. And the dragon, the devil, was enraged with the woman, church, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Oh, friends, that's saying right down at the end of time that the devil is going to be mad. He's enraged. If you think you're going to get off scot-free, you're sadly mistaken. I run on to these people that think that when you accept Jesus Christ, the devil's going to leave you alone. No, he's not. No, he's not. I have people say, well, Brother Cox, I didn't have any trouble till I accepted the Lord. You know? And I've, I've seen people accept the Lord and the devil hit them with everything he had. And finally they say, well, man, if this is the way it is, I'm going to give up. And they'll, so they'll stop following the Lord, and the old devil backs off, see? And they say, oh, that's much better. And then all of a sudden, he hits them hard as he can hit them. You know why? Because he's the devil. That's just the way he is. Now, let me just tell you something. He's enraged with the church, it says. The rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to make a decision. There's only one way that you can ever be free. Do you know that? Only one way. And it simply says, and you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. Now, dear friend, you're going to have to say, listen, I'm going to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to be free in conscience. I'll tell you why, I have something. If you think you're going to get into heaven on the coattails of your husband, you're sadly mistaken. And you husbands, if you think you're going to make it into the kingdom, on the apron string of your wife, you're sadly mistaken. You're going to have to make up your mind to serve the Lord. You shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. That's what makes us free. That's what gives us hope, is Jesus Christ. I'm going to have to pick up the scripture and read it for myself. And I'm going to have to make that decision to follow what it says. I want you to listen tonight as Steve sings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this evening, we thank you for your word that we can safely follow. We ask tonight that each one of us may place our lives in your hands, that we may walk with thee all the way into the kingdom. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen.